Okay, so um, moving from Anglo-Saxon Gothic literature, which uh, I'm an historian by training, I could live there if I wanted to, um, and moving from just a teaser, frankly, of what is there in Tolkien's world, um, we're now moving into C.S. Lewis. And we're going to do a bit of the same. I'm going to give you uh, a look at the Narnia series, or the Narniad, as it's called by historians. Um, and I'm going to ask the question, how have you been reading this book, or these books? Because when it, when it comes to The Hobbit, I think you do get a lot of, well, these are children's stories. Um, they're, they're good in some senses. If they're, if they're good, it's because they're moral. Uh, that a Christian man wrote them. There's, there's a lot of, you know, there's not wanton death, these kinds of things. Um, the Narnia series, in particular Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, gets really the same treatment. Um, just go on Facebook and complain about one of the movies, and someone will say, well, it's just children's literature, you geek. Calm down. Um, I've had that happen to me. It's not nice. Don't do that to people. Uh, <laughs> but um, you do often get this sense of uh, being unwilling to think that a children's story could ever give us anything deeper. And actually, if you read Lewis in particular on this, he says repeatedly that it's exactly the opposite. He says, if you watch how children read or how they learn, or if you tell them a story, just pay attention to how they interact with that story. He actually gives an analogy. He says, if you were to tell a story about three men standing on a road, and you were to then paint the picture of what's going on around the road, and then you were to come back to the three men, and you were to suddenly say that there were two men, that you will get yanked on the arm, and you'll say, hold on, hold on, hold on. What happened to the third man? And, the, and Lewis says, the child won't be asking because you're inconsistent. They'll be asking because they're in the world you've been painting, and you've just somehow put a square peg in a round hole on, for them. That the way that they engage with the story um, is not, I have a, a six-year-old and a three-year-old, and I, I'm always actually astonished by this. Their, their main question is, is that real? Their, their main question is, are you being consistent, and is it a real world that I can kind of get immersed in? And what Lewis says is, as we grow up, we very often find ourselves leaving behind the things of the past and assuming that imagination or somehow using our right brains, the right side of our brains, the right hemisphere, or using the artistic side of who we are, whatever it might be, that the imagination is somehow the thing that fools us. And so we become cold, we become logical, and we become cruel. And Lewis says, far be it from us to stop being children. Uh, G.K. Chesterton, in one of the books you're reading for this class, talks about this as well. He says, when the Bible is using the imagination, it is not saying, behind this closed door, there's a dragon. He says, a five-year-old will say, okay, open the door. Oh, there's no dragon? Okay, you, what, what's going on here? What, what are you doing? Rather, uh, Chesterton says, the biblical pattern of the imagination is to be shocked that there's even a door, to look at God's creation in all of its facets, and just to wonder at it to always get lost in stories, and to read and to experience things like a child. And so Lewis very much likes children's literature, but he himself also, just like Tolkien, weaves in other elements that are meant to be discovered. Now, Lewis is also keen on this. It, they don't have to be discovered. You can just enjoy the books. You can read all of them and enjoy them just as they are, but very often, he says, you will discover more. And with a little bit of effort, a little bit, a little bit of elbow grease, you can actually really dig down and discover other things. Now, what I'm about to tell you it has to do with C.S. Lewis and the planets. Very, very sort of interesting thing. Um, I have to go ahead and, and say from the very beginning um, that this is not um, Ryan's discovery. This is the, the discovery of this handsome man here. His name is Michael Ward. Uh, he's a, he is a friend of mine. I came to know him. He was a pastor in Cambridge. Uh, but he's also he's a scholar. Uh, in fact, he is probably one of the top two or three, maybe perhaps even the number one Lewis scholar in the world. Um, at one point, uh, Lewis's house that he had in Oxford has since become a museum. And at one point, Michael used to run it. 
Now, Michael goes by a very un-British name. He goes by the name of Spud. Um, so Spud, uh, actually, during his doctoral dissertation, uh, really, I think, I wouldn't say cracked the code, but he came up with something that has really been lying right there in front of us all these decades about Lewis and the Narnia series. And so everything I'm about to say comes from that guy, and I, I want to just go ahead and mention his book. But the book is called Planet Narnia. Uh, it's, it's a popular level book. It's written for anybody if you enjoy reading. Uh, I, I can say emphatically it is well written and actually really, really inspiring, really interesting stuff. And it's a lot of what I'm going to be saying today and then some. Uh, if in this class you, I was actually assigning secondary sources, this would be the first one on the list. So I do want to say, if, if anything that I'm saying now or anything about Lewis sparks interest, this is a book you need to buy. But, but what I'm about to say is really the kernel of what Spud has found, and that is he's found an interpretive key to the Narnia series that we had not known until, frankly, until the last couple of years. And that is the planets. What do I mean? Well, when you look at uh, medieval and Renaissance literature, just the world of the medieval world and the Renaissance. Of course, they don't have modern science, they don't have modern telescopes, they don't have the capacity to see, frankly, beyond essentially the naked eye when they look at the sky. And Lewis was enthralled by this idea. There's a picture of it here, uh, excuse me, there's a picture of it here that, that really kind of gives a sense, this is actually a drawing from the Middle Ages. At the center, of course, is the Earth itself, it's still geocentric, Copernicus hasn't come along yet. Uh, and out of it, going from the earth out, are the known celestial spheres. The sun is considered to be a planet. Of course, it's not now, but it's considered to be a planet in the medieval world. The moon is considered to be a planet. And so on and so forth going out. All the way up until the point where the naked eye fails us, and so they were unaware of the outer three most, of course, now it's the outer two most planets. Pluto is gone. It's now just a rock. Um, uh, we don't believe it's a planet anymore. Well, this is the medieval world. As it looked up into the planets, uh, into the sky rather, it wondered, it marveled at God's creation. And it saw in the created order a simple majesty. And Lewis loved this because he said, so much of our science, despite the good things that it, it gives us, makes space this cold vacuum that has nothing in it but rocks. And he says repeatedly, it is not that. The universe itself, the world outside of our planet, is just as much God's beautiful creation as anything we experience here. And so what Lewis says is, the planets as archetypes, as symbols, as really conceptually as ideas, was something that he cherished from the medieval world. Because in the medieval world, each planet had its own personality. Each one had its own mythology. Now, some of this is from pagan sources, Greco-Roman myths, and others. But Lewis at least knew that as the medieval world was Christianized, they didn't say, well, you know, we don't care about the planets anymore, uh, but rather they kept the names and they, and they Christianized the concepts that each planet in God's order has, again, a personality to it. I'm going to go through those in a, se in a, in a second, but I, but I want you to understand, Lewis was himself an, uh, an expert in medieval and Renaissance literature. This only made sense to him because he lived in this world. So just as Tolkien is an Anglo-Saxon Gothic scholar, so Lewis, as a medieval and Renaissance scholar, finds in his research, in his studies, in his love of uh, old books, these kinds of things. Now again, all these planets have their own concepts, they have their own names, and they have their own personalities. The problem, though, is just what in the world does it have to do with the Narnia series? Where's the lion? Where's, you know, where are the children? What's going on here? How in the world could the medieval view of the planets connect and tell us anything about the Narnia series? Well, the simple answer is, it doesn't until, frankly, you read his letters where he talks about it, or when you connect the Narnia series to his other books. Because Lewis actually did write a space trilogy. He wrote an entire three-volume set of descriptions of the planets. He describes, he describes space travel. And in that book, repeatedly, he talks about God's creation. 
One of the most famous scenes in the first book is when Ransom, who's the, the main character, and, and Ransom, by the way, is Tolkien. I don't know if you knew that. But the, the main character in the Space Trilogy is this short, kind of dowdy philologist uh, with frumpy clothes who likes to talk about words all the time. That's Tolkien. Uh, and so Tolkien is really the protagonist. He gets on this ship, and there's this famous scene where as he's going out into space, he expected to find this cold vacuum. And actually, as, as Lewis paints this picture, he's bombarded with the rays of God's glory. And that he actually becomes more alive by experiencing the fullness of creation in this sense. It's not cold and dead, it's alive. There is something of God's glory shining in it. More on that in a second. So Lewis had already written something on the, on the solar system, and I'll get to that in a second. But his last book is called The Discarded Image, published in 1964, a year after Lewis's death. It was published posthumously. And in this book, if you read it, Lewis actually unpacks the entirety of this medieval worldview of the, of the solar system. He talks about each planet. He talks about their personality. He unpacks the entire story of just how the medieval world thought about creation. And he says, as, as the title indicates, that we have thrown away this wondrous joy of creation. And we've made them rocks or fireballs in the sky that give us, sun, give us the sun or gravity or some other kinds of things. Other than that, eh, don't need it. I need cold, calculated reason. I don't need the creation. And in the discarded image and in his letters, Lewis repeatedly says that the planet mythology, and he calls it mythology, he's not saying that the planets actually have personalities, but he said it evokes in us something that has been lost. <laughs> not something that we have to sort of close our minds to and somehow become medieval. What he says, though, is that we moderns are to be pitied because we allow hyper cold, critical realism to crush joy and beauty. And God's creation becomes sterile, and the joys of life become humdrum, and so we have to jam our bodies full of pills to make us happy again. Now, I'm not saying that Lewis is an idealist. He's not. But what he is saying is, is that if we believe that the science and our technology and our advancing and all these things of life make us happy, then you're kidding yourself. Just take the medieval world, this supposed dark age that looks at creation and understands it rightly. So let me just give you real quick, um, just a bit on Lewis from the, the Space Trilogy, just to connect this. So this uh, is the, the essence of the cosmology. There's a whole bunch of planets that he describes in his Space Trilogy. But the essence of the Space Trilogy is this cosmology, this understanding of creation. And the, our solar system, in his language, uh, in the trilogy, he calls the field of Arbol. Now, Arbol is the sun. So when Lewis is looking in a space, or describing in a space trilogy the, the solar system that Ransom is going into, he's describing it as the field of Arbol. And the Christ character in this story is Melodil. Christ character, he's not Christ directly, but the one who is the Redeemer, who is the Lord, who takes on the characteristics of Christ is Melodil. And as the story unfolds, we find out that there is someone called the Bent One. Satan, frankly. Who has caused our planet, in Lewis's world, to rebel. To shut its ears, Lewis says, to the song of heaven. And so therefore, our planet out of the entirety of the universe, is the silent planet. Because as heaven is singing, and as the joys and wonders of God's creation are being sung, Lewis says, our ears have been shut, we have closed ourselves off, and we are no longer engaging in the world because we have rebelled. So that's the core, right? And in this world, he has three planets. Of course, he has the Earth, which he calls the Thulkandra, which is called the silent planet. Mars, and then the last book, he talks about Venus, or Paralandra, which describes, uh, sorry, the second book, he describes Paralandra, which is the idea of what if Ransom comes across a world that had, did not fall, where they were tested and yet endured. And he says a great deal in it about creation, about how sin has ravaged us. One of the, I think, more poignant parts of that story is Ransom comes across a, a naked figure, unfallen, and perceptively, ransom does not experience lust. 
And what, what Lewis sort of draws out is the ways in which the, the, the good creation of the human body has been perverted, that we lust after it now, that we want to, to, to own it, to, to dominate it, to, uh, to do things that shouldn't be done between unmarried couples, these kinds of things. And so in this world, and Venus is this uh, unspoiled creation. So that's just, again, just a, a nutshell of the space trilogy. Question. If, t if two of Lewis's books are incessantly talking about the planets, is it really a wonder that the, that the Narniad, the Narnia series, might not have a bunch of planet things going on as well? In other words, just as in the discarded image, as Lewis says, he has spent his life thinking about this idea of the medieval view of the planets. And just as in his space trilogy, which were some of his earliest books, he actually kind of dabbles with naming planets and giving them kind of characteristics, etc. What Spud, what Michael has found, is that the Narnia series actually is lined up according to each medieval planet. Have you ever read the Narnia books and wondered why they are so different? Some are sort of enthralling and interesting, and then the next one is just a bunch of war and a bunch of killing. And the next one is the weird one about the horse and his boy, and then there's the one with the silver apple, which, you know, Lois, did you get the apple of the Garden of Eden wrong? Why is the apple healing the lady? It's the poisonous apple. What's going on here? Why are they so different? Well, what Michael's able to, I think, has proven definitively, and just about everyone has adopted this, is that what Lewis is doing is purposeful literature based on the medieval world. Now, first and foremost, you need to know, of course, that the publishing order, <coughs> excuse me, of the Narnia series is actually out of the, the uh, sequential order in terms of the narrative itself. Um, first and foremost, of course, the, the, the first book Lewis uh, published was The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And it seems to be, at least, at least this is some of the, the evidence that's there, that he wrote the book and enjoyed it so much that he then decided that he was going to create a seven-part series that more fully sort of was devised according to this medieval understanding of the planets. And so at some point he starts sticking books in the beginning, and he shoves one in the middle, and he does all this kind of jumbling. Uh, today, if you buy a, a modern edition of it through HarperCollins, you'll actually get it in the uh, the chronological order, not the original order, which always had Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe at the beginning, etc. It's kind of a jumbled mess sometimes. But what Lewis, we know, did is he wrote the first book, and it was a wild success, and then he decided to do a little bit more. Well, what did he do? Let me go through these with you. And I'm only, gonna, again, going to pique your interest. And if you've already read them, you might want to go back and read them and, and notice all the things that you're about to, I think, discover in the Narniad. The first planet, and I'm not doing these in any, any general order, but, um, I, but the first planet that I'm going to talk about is the moon. And in the medieval world, the moon was called Luna, and the characteristics or the personality that the moon had were, strangely enough, dew, wetness, dampness, and water. Well, in some senses, that just makes perfect physical sense. The moon is out at night. That is when dew condescends. Uh, the medieval world did know that the moon somehow controlled the tides, that there was something involved there. There is clearly something that, that, in which that you can associate the moon with water, right? Well, what in the world does it have to do with Narnia? There's no moon. There's not a lot of talk of water. Or is there? If you go back and read The Silver Chair, you will, explore, you will notice that repeatedly, literarily, Lewis actually concocts the entire thing to occur in repeatedly at night, and there's always references to water. The account that I read, the, 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 the story that I told at the beginning of this evening of Jill needing water, standing in front of the water, needing this kind of thing, comes from The Silver Chair. One of the other main characters is what? Puddle glum. There is repeated literary connections to wetness, to dew, to the ways of the, of the created order, having rains fall upon it, uh, even at the point when Aslan breathes and causes Jill to go off the mountain and land safely down in Narnia. It is repeatedly said that she swims in the current of his breath. 
over and over and over again, there are these concepts of wetness and of rejuvenation through the giving of water. Next. Jupiter. Now, Jupiter is the kingly planet. Uh, in the medieval world, Jupiter was referred to as Jove, and you've probably heard weirdos say, by Jove, I think he's, ha I think he's got it, which is another way of saying, by God, I think he has it. Jove was another name in uh, older sort of English, more Shakespearean English, uh, another word for God. This idea that God is the king. He's the king of creation, right? Well, Jupiter and Jove always have a couple of elements going with it. First of all, of course, is kingliness, royalty, this concept of being um, sovereign, of being lordly. But, interestingly enough, this is only a medieval would think this way. Someone being lordly king brings cheerfulness, tranquility, and being festive. Again, we, we're so used to overthrowing tyrants in this country that we, we sometimes don't think of kings as being the things that bring us festivities and, and, and joy and these kinds of things. In the medieval world, a good king, a king that was like God the king, brought joy and, and uh, happiness and all kinds of things. Well, naturally, I think, or not I think, uh, that Michael has shown, lie in the witch in the wardrobe. You think, okay, I could see some king stuff there. You have Jesus, uh, or Aslan rather, uh, acting kingly. But think about it again. What happens at the end of that book? Sons of daughters and, uh, sorry, sons of Adam and daughters of Eve become royal. They begin to, as they are experienced Aslan, they begin to recapture and rediscover the glory of the image that they were, and so they take on seats of power. What about festivities? Don't you meet Santa in this, one, in this book weirdly? What is Santa doing in Narnia? Well, what's the phrase that's used? Always winter, never Christmas. That because they have put, because Narnia at the time has put itself under an evil tyrant, an evil king, queen, I should say, that they have lost the festivity. They have lost the cheerfulness. Read the book again, and at, throughout the end, of course, we stop and go, there's Jesus dying, and then he's resurrected, which that is clearly what's happening. Read all the stuff around it, though. When Aslan goes around breathing onto people and, and waking them up, there is nothing but joy and festivity. They all start laughing at one point. This king has restored order, and because of it, just as in the medieval sense with Jove and this personality, the, the line the witch in the wardrobe, as Lewis intended it, shows this kingly thing. Now, that's, that actually clicked something in my mind when I read that in Michael's book, because I remember, and you might have felt experienced this as well, you read the line the witch in the wardrobe, you love it, you read the next book, and you're like, where's Aslan? Like, there are books where he just doesn't show up until, like, the epilogue, and he's like, hey, you know, I was here the whole time, you know, and you're like, no, you weren't, you know, this kind of a thing. It, but at the end of it, um, what happens is, is in a book that is designed to talk about the kingliness of God, it's only natural that Aslan is going to be on every page, just about. Next, Saturn. Saturn in the medieval world was the worst planet. It was the bad one. Uh, Saturn was the one that brought things like sickness. It, it was the one that brought home the concept of old age, of failure. In fact, uh, we sometimes talk about father time. Well, young people don't, but older people increasingly will talk about father time coming. Uh, and father time, actually, in the medieval world, was associated with Jupiter. Sorry, Saturn. Saturn was, in some ways, whenever they tried to um, describe um, the, uh, the idea of age and, time and you know, uh, the, de the decay of time, it would often be Saturn is Father Time, this kind of a thing. Very sort of bleak, very dark themes, these kinds of things. Go read The Last Battle. It is filled with sickness. Filled with corruption. More so than... Frankly, even more so than the book where Aslan dies and is resurrected. This one has the one of sickness, of death, of the decay of things. And you remember the monkey character in it? 
just absolutely one of them. It's tough to deal with when you're a kid. You're like, why? What is wrong with that guy? He's just always like corrupting and perverting and twisting and, and trying to cause the thing to decay. And, and Lewis very clearly has this concept of, as he's writing the book, he wants to sort of conjure up this idea, this, this personality of the book as being something of decay, of time, of corruption. And of course, at the end of it, because it is the last battle, there is the putting of all things right at the very end. Next, Venus. This is one of my favorites. Venus. Venus, if you look up, was always the morning star. It's also the evening star because you see it both in dusk and in dawn. And Venus um, is the one associated with the magician's nephew. And Venus uh, was in the, um, in the old pagan mythology, uh, the goddess Aphrodite. There's all this concept of sex, of intimacy, of joy, etc. Well, in children's literature, you typically don't go for those themes. Um, but what happened, and this is true in the Middle Ages as well, they take the concept of Venus, of, of fertility, and they, they expunge the pagan stuff out of it. And what they start to talk about is this concept, whenever they're talking about Venus, of renewed intimacy, of restoration in that fullest sense of a broken relationship that comes back, of uh, a married couple that are separated perhaps for, for a period of time, they come back together and there's an intimacy, both spiritually and mentally and physically of friendship and all these kinds of things. In other words, what happens in the medieval concept is they get rid of the, again, the pagan Aphrodite concepts and they make Venus in this, this whole concept that is wrapped up in the planet Venus, the idea of restoration and renewal. Well, not surprisingly, the magician's nephew is where Aslan sings creation into being. It is intimate. It is very, very passionate. And not only that, here's a bonus. Remember that silver apple that we think Lewis somehow has screwed up his understanding of the apple of the garden and heals the mom, this kind of a thing? Well, in the traditional understanding of Venus, there was believed to be the daughters of, uh, I can't pronounce the name, Hesperus. The daughters of Hesperus who ruled and tended an apple orchard. And the apples were said to restore life. And, intim and intimacy and health. And they protected it from people that would come and try to steal the apples and these kinds of things. And so very, very famously, Lewis has actually this woven into the story. The, the little boy takes the silver apple at the very end, he gives it to his mother, and she has restoration at the end. She's healed. The, the book, though, repeatedly, uh, the magician's nephew repeatedly talks about these concepts of restoration, intimacy, and the goodness of God's creation. Again, Aslan sings creation into being. It's a, it's a beautiful, by the way, de depiction. He stole it from Tolkien, by the way. More on that later. Tolkien in the Silmarillion has uh, a god, and he does have God, uh, sing creation into being as well. More on that later. But, but Lewis took that from him. Tolkien never forgave him for that. Um, but he does put in there this concept of God singing creation into being. The next one is, is very obvious. The sun. In the medieval world, the sun was not considered to be a ball of fire. It was actually considered to be a golden, beautiful jewel of the sky. Now, they knew it brought heat, but they didn't think that was the most important element of it. In fact, as they looked at the sun, they thought of a number of different things. They thought of the sun, uh, as I say here, as the winged chariot, which is this idea of this selfless, planet that God has placed in the sky that, that nourishes us and is just full of beauty. And so what happens is you, you connect that with the dawn treader. Now it's just right there in the name, folks. Dawn, sun, sky, it's get, we're, we're getting a little bit obvious here. But if you follow the themes, selflessness was how the medievals viewed the sun's personality. One of, one, someone being selfless. Someone having generosity. Someone using their generosity out of freedom, not out of obligation. And, this is more interesting, riches and alchemy. Now, alchemy is that weird science, of course, we try to, try to turn an imprecious metal into a precious metal, usually lead into gold. 
Uh, but alchemy in the Middle Ages was not considered voodoo or superstition. Uh, they actually thought you might be able to do this. They were eventually proved wrong. Um, but at the end of the day, selflessness, generosity, and freedom, they thought, are the very things, the very context, the very elements of uh, virtue that actually leads to riches and goodness and the things of this world. And then somehow they tied it up with alchemy in the sense that when they looked at the sun, they saw this golden uh, jewel in the sky. They thought of it as being gold-like. And so alchemy gets wrapped up in it. Well, as I always say, there's nobody more, there's nobody more selfless than Reapy Cheap. Reapy Cheap is one of the most favorite characters in all the Narniad. Uh, he is, uh, almost stands out for his seeming perfection. I mean, he, he, he's not perfect in that sense. But, I mean, the, the Dawn Treader is one of these things where Aslan's just kind of MIA for a while. Like, he, he's gone, and they're on this boat, and then they get to this house, and then Aslan walks in, and he's like, hey guys, what's up? And then he just talks to them for a while, then he leaves. Meanwhile, all of the time, Reapy Cheap is the one kind of keeping them on the straight and narrow. And you get this sense, and, and it kind of comes out as, as the story unfolds, that Aslan has appointed those who are selfless, who are virtuous, who are brave, and that they uh, are heading towards where? The sun. More importantly, so this is often overlooked, there's alchemy in this book. There be gold there. They get to this island, which they call the, the, uh, the gold island. They're putting things in, into it. And they're coming up gold, this kind of thing. And this is the Christian element of Lewis coming out. They very nearly die there. That, that their desire for riches, the only person who, who does not succumb to that, that desire to just become wealthy beyond your wildest imaginations is Reapy Cheap. Everyone else is like, yes, put some more in there. Our oars, so we can't paddle anymore. That's fun. All these kinds of things are going on. Uh, and at the end of the day, their, their gluttony very nearly takes them under. Were it not for Reapy Cheap and the selflessness and the generosity and the free giving of a couple of the characters. The next one, Mars. Mars, of course, was the ancient god of war. The planet itself gets associated with the god of war primarily because it's red. The redness of this planet uh, is, is sort of hailed as this idea that it is always in battle, that it is blood red because it is shedding blood. That's one of the great sort of images of it. But it's more than that. Battle, war, knights, bravery, and even treachery. Well, this book, uh, the book that is associated with this in Lewis's mind is Prince Caspian. Read Prince Caspian. What in the world are people in middle school and high school age doing, actually they're a bit younger than that, putting on armor and killing things? I mean, this, dry, this is driven home for me when you actually see it on the, on the movie uh, screen. Like, I'm sorry, those aren't knights. What are they doing? Like, why are the children fighting? And so much of the book, actually, is just fighting repeatedly, waging war, becoming knights in a manner of speaking, fighting incessantly. Now, in this case, it's for the good of Narnia, for the good of other things, but repeatedly, the, the, the backbone of it is that Mars and war are wrapped up in this concept of Prince Caspian. All right, one more. Mercury. Have you ever struggled through a horse and his boy? Trying to figure out what's going on there. Well, a horse and his boy are tied up with this idea of the planet Mercury. And if, uh, in, if I were using a real geek word, if I were to say, oh, that person's being very mercurial, what do I mean? They're obtuse, they're veiled, they're, they, you can't really understand what they're saying, they're, they're being kind of shadowy and mysterious. All these kinds of things. This idea that being mercurial is somehow being veiled and distant and hiding oneself. Well, the reason why that word is in our English uh, vocabulary is because the personality of uh, the planet Mercury in the medieval world was associated with things like, as I say here, the Lord of Language. That's the thing Lewis adds. This idea about how our language can be veiled and vague and how we can speak one way and be unclear and lose people on purpose, the way we can attempt, we can feign being nice and yet be rude at the same time, these kinds of concepts. 
Lewis sees language in that. But in the medieval world, there's you're being mercurial, there's being hidden, being swift, which is a strange thing. But in the medieval world, to be swift was to run away from people so they wouldn't find you. And, believe it or not, providence. That was one of the big ones. How does the Bible describe providence? God's providence in particular. What's that? My ways are not your ways. That's a bit mercurial at times. God, why did this happen? Sometimes the answer doesn't come. Sometimes providence is shadowy, we say. Sometimes God's ways are not always obvious. Why does the young child come down with cancer? Why does that person die in the car wreck? Why do these things happen? And I, and I always say, biblically, you can go one of two ways. Um, one is bad, one is good. Paul talks about sorrow unto death, rather sorrow unto life, which is, I think, pastorally, this concept of you can wallow in the concept of why me, God, which then leads you to this should not have happened, God, which then leads you to how dare you, God, which at that point has put you in an adversarial role with God, which is clearly where Job ends up. I mean, God doesn't talk the way he talks to Job to everybody, does he? But where Job seems to be sort of inching is towards the, how dare you? How, how, how dare this happen to me? And then God just does the sort of classic, I'm sorry? Uh, in that parental sense, I'm sorry, who are you? This kind of thing. And he's doing it not because God doesn't have an answer, but because where Job's heart has gone towards lack of loyalty towards God, lack of trust. There is, of course, Paul says, and the scriptures are full of this, a sorrow that is always trustworthy, that is wrestling, that is challenging, that says, why God, without saying, how dare you, that goes this way, the other way, the opposite direction. Providence does this. Sometimes it, the, the, the challenge of it puts us to the test. Uh, have you ever gone through a difficult time and you find out who you really are? <laughs> Not the sanitized version of who you are. Have you ever asked your spouse or your closest friend, am I really like that? And they're like, yes, yes, you are. Yes, you are always like that. You didn't know that because you are always like that. <laughs> they, will, they will shoot straight. This kind of concept. Well, this idea of providence of the hiddenness of God sometimes is significantly, the, I think, the major theme of A Horse and His Boy. There's, there is constant movement as Shasta moves from being the, the son of the king, being part of the noble house, to being suddenly a slave, a farm boy, down the lowest rung of society. What a lot of scholars have said is they, th they think what Lewis has done here is do uh, a bit of a reverse Moses story. Shasta is actually discovered in the water. He's actually does, does some, he, he goes on a journey. And then over time, the, the God of the universe calls this pagan, this, this man who's lost himself in the pagan world, he calls him back to himself. I think there's probably something to that. But what is the kernel of all of the book is this idea that Aslan is providential in this book. There's this story of Shasta in the dark taking his horse. He's walking up this road and he's near the edge. And he keeps hearing what he feels to be another being sort of supporting him, not letting him fall off the edge. Then at the end, he discovers what? Well, it's Aslan. He's there the whole time. And then Shasta seems to indicate, why didn't you tell me? And the answer is, I don't have to tell you everything, Shasta. I am always there supporting you, Aslan says repeatedly. The book, in other words, talks about, A Horse and His Boy talks about, not just the conversion of any old pagan, but the conversion of all of us. Because we were all those same people. We were all we, uh, very, very significant. I would say probably most of you, if not every single one of you, if we took the time and you told your story, you can look to the time before you were Christian and you can say, boy, God had me there, didn't know it. There was, there was some hand of God at work and I had no concept of this. Now I see it. And that is woven throughout this book, this idea of God's providence, of, of how he hides himself sometimes. Uh, and then this concept of swiftness. In this book, this is the last thing I'll say about planets for now, um, in this book, uh, it describes Aslan repeatedly as being faster than the horses. 
He is a quick, nimble-footed being, that he is, he is the God of speed and swiftness and these kinds of things, Aslan is. Now, why in the world, if this is so obvious to some, why in the world did Lewis not just put somewhere, at, maybe on the book cover, you know, see my other book on the discarded image, or see Wikipedia on the medieval view of the planets? He doesn't tell us any of this. Why? Well, he actually does talk about this in one of his letters uh, to a close, close friend. And again, Lewis is always tarred and feathered with this allegory word, right? And I spent the first half of the evening saying, Tolkien does that too, y'all. Let me soften your, your, your uh, allegorical interpretation of Lewis. Lewis has just as much of an aversion to allegory, uh, allegorical readings, I should say, in a certain light. Lewis talks about stories and he says, when you read a story <clears throat> and you just simply enjoy it, and then later you find out that there was a depth and a richness there, you're actually happy sometimes, at least uh, ideally. Depends on what the allegory is, I suppose. But, but he says, in general, if you've loved a story and then you find out there's a depth of meaning there, you, you don't throw the book away. You go back and read it. So it actually fleshes out the story. It makes it more appealing. He, he says, however, and hopefully I haven't done this for many or any of you here, if you haven't read the story and someone goes, hey, by the way, it's all the planets and here's how it lines up. Here's a chart. Just take that with you when you're reading it and read it this way. He's, what happens? All the joy goes out. Suddenly you, you have a, a math problem in front of you where, where you're trying to connect all the dots. He says, and then you're not enjoying it. And so he says, and again, this is very medieval, hide deeper concepts. This idea of God's providence in books or this idea that God is a king. Really wrap that in that book. And he says, and people will just enjoy it for its own sake. And that's fine. He says, but you can then, if you discover that there's more going on here, that there's more about God than just the fact that Aslan dies and is resurrected, he says, then you'll actually appreciate the book more. So he, he actually says, purposely hide things. That's sort of a leprechaun idea. You find the, the rainbow in the pot of gold, and you will learn what the Narnia series is. But in fact, Lewis does this on purpose. And Michael or Spud uh, has done a, a, just a wonderful job of pulling all of these threads together. And when you read the book, it is utterly clear. What, what Lewis wants to do is to evoke different themes in different books, seven unique themes. If anything, when I, when I, found, when I found that out, when I read the book, I, I was actually shocked that he wrote one a year. Because it's, you know, it, was, it was interesting enough that he wrote seven unique stories. Now to realize that he is spending times on his choice of verbs, on his noun choices, if he's writing a book about dampness or dew or water, he's very, being very careful to craft the whole thing so that it evokes this sense of the moon or the lunar, the, the concept that, that are associated with this. All these things. In other words, he's working ridiculously fast for someone who has such a complicated <laughs> scheme that he's working with. But he's, it's a richer book. It's a deeper book than, than a dip, deeper set of books, I should say, than, than I think have ever really been appreciated. <coughs> okay, let's put this back together. I'm giving you a whole bunch of stuff on Lewis and Tolkien. What does this mean for this course? What does it mean for where we're going? Well, the short answer is, is I think the, the, the ultimate reality of what we have to do whenever we're delving into the theology or the writings or the, the faith of people in the past. I always say, if you can't interview the guy or the gal, you're doing historical theology. You're doing historical research. You have to find out who they were. You have to find out what made them tick. And so tonight, we've, we've looked at a set of books by Lewis and the one book by Tolkien that are so understood by, the, by just about everybody. And they are understood and enjoyed. I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a snob by any, any stretch of the imagination. I don't hate the movies. I hate a couple of them, but I don't hate the movies, um, or I hate parts of some of them. Uh, but but I'm not a snob about this. But the but what I, what we have to do, I think, whenever you are a committed Christian, is you have to learn the skill or the art of understanding something that's not right in front of you. You have to say, what is this book about? And I think that's just as true when you're reading a biblical book as when you're reading Narnia and these other kinds of things. It's the same skill. 
It's what is Paul doing here? What is the author of Hebrews driving at here? Why do they keep repeating this phrase? Why do they say these things? What's going on in the world around this period of time in this book? Now, our, our biblical faculty are phenomenal at training you in that. And so you're getting a lot of that here. But in this class, we're going to be doing it through the lens of Tolkien and Lewis. Now, I purposely use these topics because I figured the geek in many of you would bring you here to take this course, that it sounded at least better than something that might be a little bit sleepy. But what we're doing in this course is we're looking at the subject of how do you read somebody from the past? And, and ideally, after the couple of lectures we've just gone through, you can probably say, well, I would never have seen much of any of that if I kept reading it just at the surface level. I would have continued to enjoy it, but there was always something I was missing. What were you missing? Glad you asked. You were missing the authors. In other words, you were enjoying it selfishly. <laughs> you were enjoying it on your own. You were, you, were con you were a consumer, not a thinker sometimes. Now, I always say the Narnia series in particular makes good quotes. It makes good sermon illustrations. I mean, the Jill story about come and drink, that's awesome. Preach that. That's good. Good illustration. But what you're often doing is you're consuming this, in a, as I always say, in a selfish way. You're consuming it as, I like this, I want this, I'm just going to keep it at what I like. <laughs> the problem is, is there's two people in every conversation, and the author is one of them. And so what you're going to be doing in this class is not learning a bunch of facts about elves and dwarves, but you're going to use uh, the, the two sets of, of readings that we're doing, a whole bunch of Tolkien and a whole bunch of Lewis, and I want you to explore themes. You have a journal element where you have to keep track of it. You have a big paper at the end. Notice there's no test. That's purposeful. Committed Christians think, and they think about all kinds of things. They don't just think only about certain things. Uh, G.K. Chesterton, very I think, love this quote. He says, there are no uninteresting topics. He says, there are only, at times, uninterested people. Meaning, you can study anything and have wonder. You can go into biology, you can go into botany, you can go into chemistry, even math, even though I stink at it, and some of you probably do as well. You can go into literature, you can read fiction, you can read fantasy. If you have a mind that has been awoken by God, you can explore things. You may not agree with everything. You may have problems sometimes with what you're reading. But what you do is you learn to actively join the conversation. The author has told you their side of the story, talk back. Learn how to engage. Learn them. So what we're going to be doing in this class is we're going to be sort of exploring the, the subterranean floor. We're going to be looking at who were they. We're going to be looking at their lives. We're actually going to be looking at something no one I, that I've found ever looks at, which is their context. The fact that Lewis and Tolkien grew up in a Victorian and Edwardian, Edwardian world means that they are, unfortunately, very snobby. They're very class distinction friendly. Have you ever noticed how Frodo treats Sam, by the way? He's basically a butler. They're not, they're not good friends. That's the only thing I don't like. One of the few things I don't like about the movie is they're always like, hey, buddy, let's go. They're like, actually, repeatedly, it's Frodo is the, is the, the lord of the manor, and Sam is, the, is frankly the gardener. He's the help in the old uh, Victorian English sense. Well, repeatedly, the world that they come from colors the world that they are. Now, it doesn't determine everything they write. But when you know who they are, you're going to know who, what they're writing in a better light. Now, again, let me stress this. What we're doing is doing a training in good Christian thinking. We're not, yes, this is going to be fun reading. Yes, this is going to excite the, um, the nerd in all of us. But what we're doing is we're saying, how can I think about these two people? How can I engage with them? And... If I engage with them well, and if I know them well, what does that open up for me as I'm reading their books, as I read their stories? Have you ever read a story in the Gospels and just scratched your head over and over and over again as to what is going on there? What's the solution to coming to an answer on that? Mysticism? Praying for just the, the knowledge to simply fall in your head without reading or thinking or doing anything else? No. The goal is to chew to marinate on, just to let it, let it just sort of sit in your mind and, and keep coming back to it. Read other Christians on it, these kinds of things. This is the good Christian life. It is thinking about God incessantly. 
Always and always, everything you come in contact with can be to the glory of God, Paul tells us. Whether you eat, whether you drink, whether you read fantasy, whether you read nonfiction, you can do all to the glory of God. And so we're reading fantasy and fiction in this class, but the goal is to train us in our minds being awake, as I always say. Don't just sit back and let everyone tell you what to think. Learn how to think. And if you learn how to think, you'll be better pastors and ministers and lovers of God's people, and you will support and nourish the church, not out of your own egos, but out of the desire to see them flourish in the power of the Spirit. 